but I'm going to do a quiz. Okay. And, yeah. um, and uh, I'll just ask you to type in the chat. Is there a way in which I can actually, well, you, you tell me. Yeah. Um, yeah. To count the number of individuals that you see in this little quiz that I'll throw up. And I know this is a bit weird on Zoom. Maybe it's better on Zoom. And here are the four examples. So I'm going to start with the top left. That's an Aspen Grove. Would anyone care to tell me how many Aspen they, are ca they could count on my little computer screen? Just give it a stab. Okay, we're getting 80, one, one, Eight. 100. All oh, right, 80, 100, did, did anyone say one? Someone said one? Yeah, several ones, then 256, one. two, okay. 53, That's good, I just hold, hold the thought. It's nice because we're actually doing the nice dichotomization that I'd hoped for. How about down the lower left, that sort of rather august looking? Uh, how many individuals do you see there? Unanimous one. A unanimous one. Okay. What about the top right? The ants. Many. Lots, 60, 50. Okay. 100. Right. 100. Not many ones. Not many ones, right. Okay. And then the lower right. How about that one? The nice, the beautiful Portuguese man of war. Many ones. Many ones. Almost unanimous. Okay. Yes. And again, a consensus there on those. So I'm going to throw up some numbers here. So, um, the correct answers, and actually this notion of correctness we can debate, is either in the hundreds or two. So these are two stands of Aspen, and I'll, I'll explain these in the subsequent slides. So you got that, I think, basically. You more or less nailed the two possible interpretations. The Darwinian one's kind of interesting. That could be one, hundreds, or actually trillions. And I'll, I'll explain that one. On the ants, I can't really see because all of your faces are covering my little answers, but not that it matters because I can guess. I mean, this would be on the order of tens, hundreds, or some fractional number, some real number that would be very difficult to calculate, and I'll explain why. And on the lower right, perhaps the most celebrated, well, along with the ants, uh, taxonomical case study of numerosity, the Siphonophora, Portuguese man of war, which could be either ones or tens, perhaps possibly even hundreds. So why this disagreement and why are you correct, I think, in saying ones or twos or hundreds? Let's start with the aspen. Well, for those botanists, you'll know that an aspen is a very interesting tree. It can grow either through a fertilized egg to produce an individual, like in that top right diagram, um, to produce the mature aspen, or it can grow vegetatively through a clonal expansion. Uh, and botanists make a distinction between the genetically coherent individual, the genet, versus various clones of itself that they would call ramets. And so by counting ramets, you correctly would guess, I don't know, tens, hundreds, but by counting genets, here there are two. And the clue here, by the way, is that uh, they flush their leaves at different times. And that's typically how you can tell how many stands of aspen there are because they have distinct patches of coloration. And the history of botany is a history of trying to come up with intriguing unpronounceable names for these things like zooids or individuoids or metamers and so on. So it's, it's somewhat unsettled, but I think we have a reasonable understanding of what's going on here. In the case of the ants, it was extremely intriguing. Um, this puzzled 19th century natural historians uh, and even into the 20th century until this paper came along by Robert Trivers and Hope Hare, which showed us the rather unique and intriguing genetic system of the ants. And this is a bit of a complicated diagram, but just to point out that you start with, say, a diploid queen, diploid meaning it has two copies of every gene like we do. Um, it produces through meiosis cell division eggs, which are haploid. A male drone, which is haploid to begin with, not diploid, can fertilize the queen's eggs, and they'll either produce a diploid worker, or if that uh, embryo is fed with royal jelly, a queen. The queen can also directly produce a haploid, haploid drone, 
from an unfertilized egg. And it gets more and more complicated. And the consequence of this strange system of chromosomal segregation and fertilization is you get weird uh, coefficients of relatedness. They're not like ours where full siblings are a half. You get sisters related to a sister with three quarters, sons to their mothers with one, mothers to their sons with a half. They're even asymmetric, these coefficients of relatedness. So when we're counting the individuals, you have to do the calculus, if you like, over these strange relatednesses. So you get fractional numbers of individuals that would be invisible if you just looked at the material ants. Darwin, I say one or hundreds or trillions, because now we know that Darwin is a symbiotic network of organism, it's him and his bacterial uh, microbiome. It's not visible to the eye, but without it, he would be dead. None of us could live without the metabolic byproducts of the microbiome. And that was only very recently discovered. And it, I just sort of think how horrified someone like Thomas Aquinas would have been to realize that he was actually largely microbial. So that's another example. We are actually a symbiotic organism. Um, we're not a single genetic uh, organism. And finally, this one, the siphonophore, uh, the Portuguese man of war. It's not a jellyfish. It's a slightly different kind of uh, creature. And this is actually a very celebrated case. Stephen Jay Gould actually wrote about this one quite beautifully with Louis Agassiz being so enamored of them that he thought of them as floating cities. Uh, he, he described them as polypersons, that they're this ultimate harmonious society. Thomas Henry Huxley, Darwin's bulldog, had uh, actually, this more or less, just slightly later than Darwin, took his own expedition on HMS Rattlesnake, which was quite fitting, I think, for his character. And he wrote one of his great treatises called the, um, uh, I think, Oceanic Hydrozoa, where he actually, in some sense, demystifies it and says they're just polyorganic. They're, it's a bit like a human body and things that you thought were individuals were just organs. It's really a part of the ongoing skirmish between the French and the English speaking world. And Heckel tried to mediate by referring to them as colonial organisms and actually wrote a book where he argued in a sort of um, pre-Hayek style that this was the right model for a decentralized self-organized society. Mm -hmm. We would now see the siphonophore rather the way we see aspens as essentially all of its parts are like ramets, but it does derive from a single fertilized egg. But that was an interesting argument that went on forever. The one final it bit distinction I want to talk about is the species question. And of course, many of you here are very familiar with this. I don't want to belabor it, but just to make the point that no one can really agree on what a species is, even to this day. Um, most famously, Ernst Meyer, the great evolutionary biologist and taxonomist here, shown with his collaborator, Sario in New Guinea in the 1920s, um, thought of them as reproductively compatible biological individuals the so-called biological species concept. And he went to New Guinea to test his hypothesis by asking whether the indigenous populations agreed with him on the Western classification of birds. And he famously wrote, the coincidence of what Western scientists called species and what the natives called species was so total that I realized the species was a very real thing in nature. Which is, if you think about it, a slightly weird conclusion to draw we are, after all, all humans, and so, I mean, I, perhaps that's not the most natural conclusion to draw, but he did. A more sophisticated uh, analysis was undertaken actually by Jared Diamond 40 years later, also in New Guinea, uh, where he wrote this rather beautiful little paper called Interview Techniques in Ethnobiology, where he points out some of the limitations of performing studies like those of Ernst Meyer. And he, here he is, that's a kind of beautiful photograph um, holding a hornbill. And he writes that, you have to read all of this, that he ex encountered a glaring error of naming. And he'd spent the day bird watching with some knowledgeable uh, local uh, individuals who had identified 55 species. And in the evening, he showed them bird pictures in a field guide. And when they saw the picture of the lesser frigate bird, they actually said that they had seen a willy wagtail. And he was, he was shocked, he says, 
by this gross failure of the experts. But then he says he looked more carefully and what he had showed them was a printed page with a black and white photograph. Now he himself had spent his whole career looking at black, black and white photographs of birds and books. But of course these individuals had not. So from their perspective, a flat black and white bird shaped image much closer in size to the wagtail to the frigate bird was correctly identified. Which gets at this really fundamental question of your background knowledge when it comes to counting the natural world. One useful way of pointing out what's been going on in all of these examples comes from uh, a metaphor with thermodynamics. In thermodynamics, we think about intensive properties, pressure, density, the boiling point, melting point, and all of these are independent of the scale of the system, of its mass. You don't change the boiling point of water by having more water as opposed to extensive properties which scale, mass, volume, entropy, Gibbs energy, and so on. And informational quantities, bit-like quantities, are by and large intensive. The genet, the genome, the species, these are intensive. Whereas the ramet, the body, or the population size are extensive. And many of those disputes that I showed you that you, I think, correctly identified in our quiz come from whether you're looking at the intensive variables, the bit-like variables, or the extensive material variables, the it-like variables. 